In this next session, we'll be moving on to environmental regulatory decisions and how to incorporate individual biological variability. Uh, our next speaker is Mike Dorson of Toxicology Excellence for Risk Assessment. Well, top of the day to y'all. It's good to be here, and thanks for the, the planning committee to invite me. So now for something very different. Uh, I'd like to do a talk that's interactive, so I'll get the chance to ask you some questions. You can, of course, participate if you wish or not. But I'm going to go through a presentation that talks about a little bit of history, some of which is still relevant and some of which I think might be considered politely to be archaic, especially in light of today's, uh, some of today's talks. In fact, in light of all of today's talks, perhaps. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about current practice. Over the last 20 years or so, we've had a number of scientists within EPA, IPCS, Health Canada, and elsewhere try to move the science of this area forward, and they have, and I'll, show, I'll share some of that with you. And then I'm going to summarize, and we'll uh, introduce uh, Wei Shui Chu, who's going to peek into the future and give us uh, maybe some new information. We are looking forward to that as well. So now I'm going to press the infamous right button. Is that correct? Oh, look at that. Wonderful. So risk assessment is preventive medicine. We're trying to prevent here. So you have to think like a clinician, which I'm not very good at, but I was in Liberia, West Africa once when the clinician was saying, I'm at the bottom of this cliff and I'm putting together bodies all day long, parasitic diseases. What someone, what's needed is someone to go on top of the cliff and build a blank, blank fence. So we're doing preventive medicine here. Hopefully we can keep our clinicians' workload less if we do our job right. One point of the hazard identification is to determine the critical effect, the first adverse effect, or it's known precursor, singular, that occurs at dose rate increases. Now, when this was written by US EPA, this definition back in mid-'80s, there wasn't a lot of information on precursors, so it's pretty easy, first known adverse effect. Now that we have all sorts of precursors, it still follows that you want to go penultimate precursor. And then one point of the dose response assessment is to determine the outcome in a sensitive group of humans, not the no sensitive individual. So if you look at the definitions of minimal risk levels or reference doses, it's sensitive subgroup. And we'll go on from that. Okay, other traditional ideas. So this is, get ready, you're going to get a question in just a minute. You're going to get tested. If we had an array of effects that were all linked to one syndrome of toxicity, what would be the point of departure for the dose response assessment? So Dr. Ashford talked about this earlier. It's the effect you have to focus on. So effects don't come by themselves, they come in syndromes. The clinician is thinking, what's going on here? It's a sequence of effects, they're all related. Which one do I pick? if you're trying to prevent. If we only had eight fingers, what would be the default composite uncertainty factor covering experimental animal to human and within human variation? Now, don't answer this right away, because I bet you would be wrong. In fact, I'll bet on it later, but, uh, but if you want to take us up on the question and answer, you can give what you think is the answer, and, and if it is, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pay up on the bet, perhaps. Okay, so now you thought about the syndrome of toxicity. How many folks in the audience know the perchlorate story? Raise your hands. Okay, you have to keep your hands down now. You can't participate in the next question. All right? All right, so the question here is, this is right out of the National Academy of Sciences, 2005, and they were saying, hey, here is the syndrome of toxicity, the sequence of effects. The question to all of you folks that are perhaps a little naive in this area, is what is the critical effect? And we're going to do a test. Here's, we're going to go backwards. Okay, the critical effect is the first adverse effect or its known precursor. So what's the critical effect? Now, I'm going to give you a hint. It's not these two. Those are methods of exposure. So you're going to raise your hand when you think we've come to it. Iodine, in, uh, inhibition of iodine uptake in the thyroid. Raise your hands for that one. Okay, next one, serum enzymes going down, these are the thyroids or the pituitary enzyme going up. How many about that? 
Okay, the next one is thyroid hypertrophy or hyperplasia. How many people think that's a critical effect? We had a few there. How about hyperthyroidism, the critical effect? Oh, you guys are being way too nice. Okay, it's not either of these two. All right, so they're not, they're clearly beyond the adverse effect. So according to EPA's definition, the first adverse effect or its known precursor, singular. So each of you picked different ones, and not surprisingly, so has the literature. People out there have picked different effects. Some because they believe that this precursor or this one or this one is appropriate. Some because they don't necessarily believe that this is the first adverse effect. And as a result of choosing different precursors or the adverse effect, one of these four perhaps, not surprisingly, you get different safe doses for perchlorate. Some of them are different than the others, and some of them different by two orders of magnitude. So it's important to, as Dr. Ashford said, to talk about the, the adversity or the syndrome of effects here as you step forward. Okay, traditional uncertainty factors. Uh, at least within US EPA, there are five of them. We're only gonna actually talk about within human. Uh, but there are others as well. And some folks, uh, they don't necessarily distinguish these five, but they use areas of uncertainty that are similar. And of course, there are some misconceptions along with uncertainty factors. First, about hormesis should not be considered. Well, I think it should. We're not going to talk about hormesis today. We don't have enough time. Studies with small n are not useful. Au contraire. If I have built a wonderful RFD on the basis of dog studies on cholinesterase inhibition, and I want to take that to the bank and put it on iris or wherever, and I have one human well characterized at that particular dose, and I see a 50% decrease in plasma cholinesterase inhibition and a 20% decrease in red blood cell, one human, one study, I have a problem. I don't think that dog reference dose is good, even though I've got uncertainty factors and everything in there. So one N is important. And so you're going to value all information. In fact, if you back up, I almost hesitate to do this, but I'll do it anyhow. If you back up to this, there are human studies where we have a no observed adverse effect level of seven individuals for this endpoint and a no observed adverse effect level in seven individuals for this endpoint. Which NOAL gives you more information? Okay, who, who votes for this one? Who votes for this one? Okay, you guys are, we need more coffee. Okay, the, the NOEL that gives you more information is this one. Because you know the sequence within this thing, these are linked together. So the no effect level here, you're not sure what happened here, especially if you didn't measure it. But down here, if you're getting a no effect level, you're more likely to have no effect levels up here. So you have more information with one particular NOEL. Oh, thank you. Yes, the water here is all over the table. Okay, we're going to unpack this slide a little bit. Let's just focus, however, on one aspect. We're going to focus on the human dose response curve here. So here's the human dose response curve. Here's the no observed adverse effect level or the benchmark dose, to use our current parlance. You divide it by an uncertainty factor of humans, and you get this no observed adverse effect level in sensitive subgroup. That's what the reference dose is. It's a no observed adverse effect level in a sensitive subgroup. Now, you'll note that some of these other uncertainty factors, this one in particular, uncertainty factor for animal to human, does not reduce risk at all. So if you see publications that talk about the benchmark dose in animals, and you divide by 100, and you get a whatever percent risk, 0.1% uh, risk, that's wrong. This uncertainty factor doesn't reduce risk. Neither does this database uncertainty factor. Neither does subchronic to chronic. You're going from one dose response curve to another. That's the intent of those uncertainty factors. This uncertainty factor reduces risk, the low observed adverse effect level to its no observed adverse effect level. So we're just going to focus on this one right here. But again, we want to talk about this particular description. And we're going to focus in on this particular factor. So what is this factor for? This is the target part of which is today's emphasis, that you're going to target this particular uncertainty factor. General physiological variation, human population, potential sensitive subgroups, 
Notice, uh, as a risk assessor, I haven't said anything about gene variability here. People with pre-existing conditions, maybe that gets factored in. I think you would emphasize that. It's not intended to cover hyper-susceptible subgroups. The RFD should be low enough to keep you from getting sensitized. If you're sensitized, it's not low enough to prevent you from reacting. If you're an organ failure, I don't think the RFD is going to help you. If there's no information available, the default value of 10 is used. And if the RFD is based on human data in a sensitive individual, like it is for nitrate, fluoride, and others on EPA's iris and other groups, a value of less than 10 is used, a value of 1 is often used. If you have a no observed adverse effect level in a sensitive subgroup of children for methemoglobinemia for nitrate exposure, that is the reference dose. There is no uncertainty. The uncertainty factor in that case is 1. Okay, so let's unpack this uncertainty factor a little bit. Cassarette and Dual, 6th edition, page 19. I'm a toxicologist, so we got trained on this thing here. Uh, of course, the top graph is mortality frequency. This is, of course, the bell-shaped curve that we were all grown up on. Here's your cumulative mortality, same information here. And here's a probit analysis, tried to straighten out the line so we could do projections of whatever. I'm not quite sure. And of course, the toxicologists don't deal with negative numbers very well, so they added five to the disease scores and made them probits. Um, it's the same as a Z score. I think this is a Z score of zero, and this is minus one. And you can see that's how we look at this. And the within human variability can be seen as different responses on the dose response curve. The sensitive individuals are the ones, of course, by definition, that respond first. Okay, back in 1983, there was an attempt to look at log probit slopes for LD50s and animals. There's a big pile of data, 400 and some responses. And it turned out that when the log dose response slope was in the range of about 1.4, that the factor you would need to go down three standard deviations was quite high, 30 to 100. If your log probit slopes were a little bit higher, like a value of two, you need a factor of 10 to 30, somewhere in that range. But most of the probability was with log probit dose response slopes that were actually greater than three. And in that particular case, if you believed that a three standard deviation reduction got you to the sensitive individuals, which it would get you in that area, then most of the chemicals analyzed, a tenfold uncertainty factor would be good enough, good enough to get you down three standard deviations and beyond. Well, let's unpack that a little bit. This is a, a slide out of a, a publication a couple, about 10 years ago. Here's your animal dose response curve, cumulative risk. Here's a human curve. We don't really know where the human curve is. It could be over here, but we think it's flatter because we're more heterogeneous than the animal population. Now we're gonna just do one more slide here. Next slide, same information. Now, instead of cumulative, this is the frequency plot. So we have animals that are they're homo, more homogeneous than the, and the humans. Here's a human no observed adverse effect level. Here's the reference dose again. Same information again. This is the, maybe the uh, general population. Here's the resistant individuals. Here's the sensitive individuals. Same information again. Sensitive individuals here, here's the normal individuals, here's the sensitive individuals. Same information each case with this theoretical construct. So why did I show you all four of these things? The reason that the point of these four slides is to indicate that there's no risk assessor in this room, nor no risk assessor on Earth, that's going to take the low observed adverse effect level of the most resistant person, that would be this dot right here, and divide it by 10 to get this reference dose. We're, off, we're down here. We're going to take a NOEL or a benchmark dose and what we think is an average group of people. If we've got the sensitive group, we're going to go down here, and we're going to divide that by a factor of 10. So the practice of us dividing something by 10 implies variability greater than 10. Now we can argue what that would be, but it's not 10. And so the target you're going for is we try to improve this area, which a lot of people have done, try to improve it, is we're looking to improve this area. And if we can get something other than 10 here based on data, that would be wonderful. 
but don't characterize what risk assessment scientists do as taking the immense human variability and dividing it by 10 to get the safe dose because that's not what we all do. Okay. That's sort of what we have been doing, some of which are still relevant. Let's talk about what has gone on now in the last, oh gosh, 20 years as we've adapted very slowly and we've come up to this chemical specific adjustment factor, EPA calls them data derived extrapolation factors. And we've been working on this concept now for at least 20 years. And we're getting to the point where risk assessment people expect this. If you come into a peer review and you have a document and you have kinetic data comparing humans and animals and you have not done this adjustment, we're gonna say, that's really good, come back when you're ready. We want to see the adjustment. We want to see you use the data to do the adjustment. And there's guidelines to do that. Again, IPCS has guidelines. So does EPA. All right, so here was an old attempt with boron back. There's a bunch of different people tried this, EPA, Health Canada, IPCS. Uh, and what we looked at was boron. And we found out that absorption's complete in animals and in, in, uh Humans, distribution occurs by passive diffusion, no metabolism. That was pretty easy to pick those numbers. When we went to clearance three to four times faster in rats and humans, notice that we defaulted a little bit conservative. We said four. Okay, we're comfortable with that. This is kind of the first time we've ever done this. Total kinetic variability, four. Now, it turned out the IPCS guidelines, the default was four. <laughs> so we did all this work and we came up with the default. I was... I can't believe it. We do all this work and we get the same as the default. What good is this thing? Well, Jay Zhao of EPA now, he was a tear at the time, just consoled me and said, hey, it's data derived. This is good. I thought, okay, fine. Uh, the dynamic default, we retained at 2.5, so the interspecies factor to be applied in this particular case was 10, which I guess was chemical specific adjustment factor. Oh, well. We went through within human variability. Now, this is the factor where you're targeting for this conference. Same as absorption, distribution, metabolism, one. Elimination, 1.8. This was based on a variation in the human parameter of GFR. And the human parameter variation in pregnant women was considered, we went two standard deviations because at the time we thought three standard deviations was not compatible with life. Now, that probably should be revisited. In 1988 or 1998, it seemed reasonable. Uh, actually, it was revisited by US EPA, and they've had a slightly different value. The default was 3.2. It was retained, so your factor is 5.7. So that led to an uncertainty factor back in 1998. At 57, we just couldn't see two digits of precision. So we said 60. EPA came along, redid this. I think their data derived factor was based on three standard deviations instead of two. So they used a factor of two. They came up with a, uh, an uncertainty factor of 66, data derived or chemical specific adjustment factor. Okay, I'm gonna race through a couple other slides because this goes right to the heart of what we were talking about today. How good is this tenfold uncertainty factor? Well, you can look at the information from Rennick and they're looking at a sub factor of kinetic variability in 19 of 22 chemicals, the subfactor, 10 divided into two subfactors that are equal, is about 3.16. It's not about it, it is to three digits. And in 19 out of 22 chemicals, that factor was good enough. There were good enough less than five for all 22. Uh, a drug, a Nauman, Bruce Nauman, is with Merck at the time, I think he still is. They published a paper, they didn't have a lot of data, but they had three for three in this particular case. Rain did some earlier work, um, and you could see newborns were poor at clearance, and so it only covered 71%. Uh, Harvey Kluwell talked about earlier if it's, if it's a met metabolite that's the toxic moiety, uh, newborns are actually gonna be better because they don't metabolize. Uh, and you can see the other things right here, a couple other pieces of uh, information here. This is the Rennick data. Again, you've got a comparison of kinetic parameters where the value of one indicates that the adult and the child is the same. And you can see these are comparisons of mean values. So in most of the time, the adult is the more sensitive 
subpopulation, a few times a child is more sensitive. So this is just data indicating whether that tenfold for this particular subfactor is good enough, or in this case, whether 3.16 is good enough. And you can see here's a, two examples where you needed a factor of about five. Okay, so a summary out of this 19 or 2002, protection of the children with the use of an uncertainty factor of either three or 10, if you could subdivide and get the kinetic parameters out fine, if you couldn't, you would be going with 10, is between 67 and 100% of the chemicals or the population. Newborns or premature infants are generally more sensitive if it's a parent compound, but of course, if it's not a parent compound, if it's a metabolite, they're more resistant. If you ever take a bottle of Tylenol and work out the milligram per kilogram per day doses, you're the sensitive individual, not your child. Uh, protection can be as low as 60% if you have severe disease. Bruce Nauman showed that if it's kidney failure, there is uh, more, there's more variability. And then studies in the large population suggest that near 100% of the population is achieved. You can actually go into that, and Bob Sonawani and Gary Ginsburg and other, others have published data in this area as well that that shows really good information. Okay, now we're gonna do a couple case studies. I got about five minutes left, I think. Um, this is John Lipscomb, US EPA. It was a case study done in this workshop series that was going beyond science and decisions. So the 2009 Science of Decisions laid a lot of good stuff out. There's been a, seri a workshop series to try to extend those findings. Uh, John Lipscomb and his colleagues at EPA said, okay, we're gonna illustrate a method, human variability, sensitive populations, you can see all the, the method illustrated. The problem formulation is how does metabolize, metabolism impact toxicity? We know that the enzyme content varies among humans. We've got in vitro data on the available enzyme. We've got a PPPK model. So here's the question. How does variability in enzyme activity influence metabolism? Wow, there's a 700-fold variability in the enzyme activity. Wonderful. It, re it reflects a 2% variability in vivo. What's up with that? So we got 700-fold variability, well beyond 10-fold. Although I'm not so sure it's well beyond the 10-fold as we use it from the low end of the dose response curve. But be that as it may, there's only 2% variability in the kinetic parameters measured in the particular study. Well, why? Blood flow limited metabolism. Even if you're poor at metabolizing this, it's one pass, 100% hepatic, one pass clearance. You can, even you can metabolize all the chemical come, coming to your liver. And it's seen for several VOC substrates. So the idea of a physiological limit is important when you start to look at variability uh, in human genomics. Now, is it always a result? Of course not. If the first pass metabolism in the liver is well below 100%, it's not that way. If a parent chemical is the toxic moiety, it may not not be that way either. And so there's some good information, not only in this particular case study, but also in the TCE IRIS document. Dr. Wei Shui Chu is the lead on that. And so you can look into that document, see other sources of variability. Okay, you can also look at mode of action, understanding. This is not only we're we looking at chemical specific adjustment factors, but we're looking at modes of action. And you can actually determine the safe concentration of nitrate in drinking water, or at least guess it. Well, by understanding nitrate needs to oxidize hemoglobin, clinically, 10% uh, uh, carbo or oxidized hemoglobin in the blood will be the clinical finding of methemoglobinemia in the child. And we can estimate how much that is by just going through this exercise. Now, is this exercise Definitive, no, because we haven't talked to a clinician. And we need to do that if we wanted to make it more definitive. But as a, just an exercise, we can go through this and we can determine how much of the nitrate you need to actually get to this level of 10% methemoglobinemia. And you can figure out how much nitrate in water is needed to cause this. And it comes out to 10 milligrams per liter measured as nitrate. Now, how many folks know what the EPA water level is in nitrate in drinking water? I know one person does. That would be Dr. Shoney. Okay, she doesn't remember. <laughs> Dr. Benson, you remember what it is? 
Okay, it's 10 milligrams per liter. All right, it's the same number as we tried. All right, now the point of this exercise is we don't have to use uncertainty factors, we don't have to use no ales, we can go to understanding the mode of action and we can work this out. We can do this ourselves without reference to algorithms. Okay, almost the last slide. I have to say a couple things about cancer variability as well because of course uh, we either use it or we don't depending on your point of view. This is an adapted slide right out of US EPA guidelines, I think in 2005, that doctors Putzrath and Shoney and others in the audience were uh, responsible for. No, actually they were them, themselves and other colleagues put a very nice guideline together back in 2005. And what they're gonna show is of course, here's your animal data and here's your central estimate and we're gonna use a confidence limit. We're gonna go down to a point of departure which is referred to here as lowest effective dose, but it's a point of departure, a benchmark dose. Forget the acronym. It's this where we're going to start. You actually adjust it for the human situation, but let's pretend that we're not going to do that here. You just draw a straight line, project it linear. That's what we do when we know the mode of action is mutagenic or we don't know the mode of action. This is what EPA and others do. All right. However, if we know that the math, the linear math, doesn't, doesn't reflect the mode of action, then we're going to use something different. And it, depending on your point of view, if you do this projected linear, the question then becomes, does this account for variability or not? Now, there are, if you believe the stochastic assumption for cancer, that it's not, you're not sensitive by getting cancer, you're just unlucky, which is, might be true for radiation carcinogenesis, then this projected linear is simply saying you're unlucky and the variability within the human population is not addressed. If, however, the stochastic assumption for chemical carcinogen is not appropriate, in other words, if this assumption is wrong, then the projected linear is likely to be more due to variability. I suppose there could be something else. I'm not sure what it would be. And then human variability is addressed as you extrapolate down the dose response curve. Now, a couple scientists that really, there's been a lot of people that think about this. It's probably a mixture of both. In fact, I heard that earlier today, perhaps. But it's something to consider when you think about human variability in cancer dose response curves, because some people will say EPA doesn't do it in others because this projected linear is stochastic. Others say, well, it's pretty conservative and we think it is covered and we still need to talk about this. And that's an important consideration. All right, so let me summarize especially since I'm out of time. It's preventive medicine risk assessment. So if you don't know what you're doing, talk to a clinician. If you're not sure about immune toxicity, foot pad swelling in mice, which we weren't, we go to someone like Mike over there, Mike Luster, and we say, what does this mean? Because us generalists don't know that. One point is to identify the critical effect. If you prevent the critical effect, the theory goes, I don't think it's dogma, the theory goes you prevent all effects. And we're really interested in sensitive human subgroups. We might even be interested in sensitive humans, but at this point, our refinement is sensitive human subgroups. Maybe this new science could really help us here, and probably could. All right, the uncertainty factor for humans is accounting for physiological and other variability in sensitive subgroups. It's not intended to cover all people, every individual, especially if you're hyper susceptible. And use data whenever possible to replace the default factors. The defaults are based on some data. If you've got chemical-specific data, use it. We expect you to use it. If you don't use it, we're going to ask you why you didn't. And finally, cancer and non-cancer assessments are really depending on different default assumptions. But we can use mode of action to understand at these and then harmonize. And EPA's done that twice, once with chloroform and once with perchlorate and probably a few others that I've missed. So thank you very much. Since nobody's crashing the podium to ask Mike questions, and we are sure. short on time, and we'll have a panel discussion as long as people are willing to put up with.